Okay, uh, moving on to our next session, we have uh, our next speaker is Mr. Meeting Tantra Aurai. He is the Executive Director of uh, A49 Architects. Today he will be speaking on innovations of architecture. So let's welcome Mr. Meeting. Um, the I think the topic for today is innovations in architecture. How can we actually in create architecture innovatively and how can we actually integrate structure into architecture? Because normally, I think in, in the West, in Europe or in, in America, that this may be quite a norm already where the designers as in architects have integrated engineering part into the architectural design. But as far as the, in the Far East, it has yet to be popular or becoming the challenge for the designer. Uh, today I've selected two projects should suit this particular topic quite well and one of the two projects on the, lat on the second project it will be the one that you guys will go and visit in the afternoon. We have arranged for the sidewalk. Uh, it's the university on the outskirts of Bangkok and the building is 2000 seat auditorium. Uh, so I think it should be quite exciting for you guys to have a look and I have arranged one of our, one of our staffs to walk you through. So that should be quite interesting and good experience. Um, basically, give you a brief, brief background, A49 is a multidisciplinary design practice founded by Kun Niti Sapitanun, who is the national artist. We have established for around 35 years. Um, Kun Niti has re um, retired six years ago and in the past six years ago it has been under the leadership of our managing director Kunpa Parkon uh, and of course we work as the board structure so we have the full board members to support Kunpa Parkon as the MD for example we are divided into three studios in total so myself and we look after studio number three, so each studio will have two board members looking after and we house around 190 staff in A49. Uh, what we, since we are multidisciplinary design practice, we also have interior firms, landscape, graphics, structure, M&E, lighting and three branches, in one in Phuket, one in Chiang Mai, one in Khon Khan. So in total, we house around 650 people all over the country. Okay. That's the structure. So we have three main studios, basically, and each studio set up, we have various discipline um, and staff levels. In, in, on the, on the right-hand side would be our affiliated firms, as I mentioned earlier, which we also have structural department. So the structural department house around 40 people at the moment and they work closely with A49 who is the mother company of all uh, in order to make sure that whenever we design some building structure it's not, not only uh, concrete columns hiding in the walls. We need to make sure that if we have time we have to challenge the structure, how can we create them innovatively. Okay. Right. Architectural innovations and challenges in tall buildings. A49 specializes in commercial buildings, especially large scale and high rises in, in the city and throughout the country also. Um, we also have been um, given opportunity to work abroad in the past six years, i.e. we are working on two twin towers, 50 and 60 story towers in Dubai on the Palm Island. I don't know if you ever heard of it. So it's just next to the Atlantis. So when the topic is all to do with architectural innovations, um, so we came up with, I selected first project to talk you through. You may have seen this project, I think some of you, if you pass along Rama 3 area. I don't know if you, are you guys based in Bangkok? No? Yeah. Okay, so you may have seen it around in, along by the river, if you drive along Rama 3. This building has 
um, one of the most difficult structural solutions I think my engineers have uh, ever come across. The location is actually nearby the Shaopriya River and this is the suspension bridge. I don't know if you are familiar with Bangkok that well. Uh, we, we started with the simple sketch first, uh, how can we actually create two towers and improve the quality of the uh, residential development. So these are the first initial sketch that we came up with. So in terms of the planning, we wanted every unit to have their own independent wall. So that meaning none of these units have attached walls to the next unit to create ultimate privacy and the privacy comes with safety. So if, if there is in case of fire incident, there is no shared risk of wall because each wall is, is independent to each unit. So that was the key. And of course we wanted to make sure the residents have um, totally private, uh, the total privacy. So we wanted to create this, if you see this black hatch, the, they represent lift core. So each, each unit will be served by private lift core. So it becomes like penthouse in, in, in its own right in all the units in this development. So with that diagram in place, we wanted to make sure also how can we integrate the facility between Tower A and Tower B. The, the, the shorter tower is called Tower A and the taller tower is called Tower B. So since we are nearby the river, we are not, the location is actually not by the river's front, but we are actually nearby the river. So the lower zone we will, not, we will never be able to enjoy the river view because I think we are further away from the river. But we realized that from the view studies that we did, when you reach up to level 40 approximately, you begin to see the river view as in the long curvature of the river all the way to Chonburi. Chonburi is the, another province outside Bangkok, like 150 kilometers away. But on the clear day, you can actually see mountains um, 150 kilometers away. So we took the opportunity to say, can we actually link the two towers together with the main facility floor? So that was the main idea of, well, these are the two, two design generators of the project. And, hold on. The challenge on this is, comprise of 45 story tower and 55 and that's where how we joined the swimming pool and the main facility on level 45 as you can see we because we are not by the river we caught something like 400 meters away so we need to make sure that's the that's the appropriate height in order for everyone to enjoy the curvature of the Travaya river video and then you can you, you probably begin to have clearer picture on the overall development so as I said to you it comprises of tower A, tower B and the parking podium. Um, one of the reasons that we normally if you have seen buildings in Bangkok they most of the designers would put towers on top of the parking podium um, but we realize that at the moment you do that you begin to create um, make the structure too complex because you're going to end up with transfer because the column bays of the towers would be a lot different to the parking bays. So we decided since we have more than um, quite a big size of land, we decided to actually free the footprint of the uh, parking podium.
to make sure that all the structure here will be will not interrupt the parking bay so that we end up with no transfer I think and speaking to my engineers the best structure is the most simple sim the simplest structural solution of all so you don't have to complicate anything and with that large parking podium footprint we also utilize the rooftop of the parking on level seven as the facility something like a community garden for the residents also but i'll move on to that later so when i zoom in into the uh, buildings i think i'll skip that that's basically when we design it we we know that the buildings both buildings have well are considered quite tall and 45 floors and 55 floors so we're talking 150 meters to 180 meters plus so how the challenge is how can we actually design incorporating the strong structure to withstand the wind load my engineer said the wind load anything above 150 meters we have to multiply everything by two anything above that so the, the most simple shape is square sorry i'll move on to that square as in one-to-one -one proportion and this is a per perfect square and in 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 the normal circumstance everyone would do just center core but since our tower footprint is quite large we're talking something like 45 meters here by 45 meters so because my footprint is almost 1000 like 900, 900 to 1000 square meter in order for me to just do a center core it won't be strong enough so we came up with um, a solution for our engineers using our footprint so if you look at this diagram since we already have the private lift th these are our, our units meaning the moment I apply lift cores are spread out into four locations we are creating like four strong legs to support and it becomes no longer just relying on the center core structure with the columns along the perimeter so with this solution it gives tremendous strength to the tower because I have four, four, four legs spread out you know, along the footprint yet we enhance the solidity with the center core because we need the service stairs and everything but this no longer becomes the, the main player of the structure the main players are these four cores and in the end these the next diagram the yellow hatch areas becomes a secondary structure to support and from the calculation this with this method we actually save the structural efficiency by approximately 20 percent than the normal conventional method from what i'm told by our engineers if you were to do the center core and then you have the columns around because I think you have to work against the lateral road on all directions of the wind load. So I think this is, this is the key and links to the topic of today. How can we actually integrate and innovate architecture and structure together? So it's no longer, I think as of present, you, you no longer just design the building and, and throw that drawing to the, to the engineer and say, right, can you come up with structure? I think being the architect nowadays, you need to think in three dimension. In three dimension meaning we need to understand how structure works, how MNE works, and then actually integrate and create the design from um, all these criteria. So, and I think this is the key how, how we actually achieve the particular footprint and the building height. And of course, this project has proven quite successful in terms of the accessibility and in terms of the architectural statement. Right, okay. So this becomes the overall primary structure and secondary structure, which I think in detail, as you can see, the shear walls along the core here on the lift core, the private lift core and the center core in the center, they're not that thick. They're only, I think, for 50 to 500 mil, as opposed to the normal circumstance for 55 solar tower, it would be around 80, 800 mil. So I think this is how we can actually reduce because we, uh, actually spread out the support throughout the footprint and I, th I think this particular structural system approach act worked with um, both towers A and B and the blue arrows represent the wind load I think with this 
symmetry, symmetrical structural layout, it allows the building to be so stable. So any wind direction from any direction will have the same um, support and strength to fight with the wind load. So therefore, when we did the wind tunnel test, um, as much as it is nearby the river with the very strong wind load, this building in the end with this structure through the wind load, the structure was able to reduce the efficiency by another 10% because it was so str the, uh, the main structural design is so strong. Okay. And then we move on to the main floor of, um, from the video of the user, this is the floor plan that when we finished the schematic design. I think, um, let me explain briefly, we actually have 80 meters long pool and on this direction would be 45, the river is, is on this orientation of the floor plan. Um, we, you have two buildings and you have one, this long bridge connecting each other. The first solution that we spoke with our engineers, AE49, was if we actually make them independent, like three elements independent, Tower A, Tower B, and the bridge, and allow movement of each to be so independent. And when, we, when, when, when they put this building model into the uh, software, um, the results show that the movement went as much as three meters. So that we were struggling three meters a lot for the, 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 for the movement. So we came up with the first option, could we actually design this bridge, linking bridge, um, on a wheel? So when, 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 when the building moves, the bridge stays, because if we have swimming pool, one, one thing that we need to avoid is any cracks and, and future cracks. So this has to stay static. Building can move. Buildings A and B, we would allow them to move on the wheel. But then, that, it, was just, it, it was proven too, too difficult and and I think almost impossible to control the movement even if it is on, on wheel. And then how, and I think to control the, the crack on the swimming pool, um, it was impossible because if you allow any movement to happen, then potential cra cracks will happen in the future. So we came up with a second solution. So I, I asked the engineer, what if we don't allow any movement? We have very strong tower A and B as a solid base. If I use this bridge structure as my main structure, like a big beam, linking the two towers together. So this acts as one tower in the end. So my explanation to my engineers was, if you look at one tower, I have four big legs. Remember on each. But when you look on the macro scale, I have four big legs in one big leg and one big leg. So I have two legs standing. And I link that with a massive beam. And this beam is not only by accident, it's intention with the design, intent to make create the facility. We need to create the bridge anyway. So therefore, the concept was given to them, so they took that approach and studied for us. And the result turned out it was much better. This building is considered as one structure in the end, the calculation and the approach. So therefore the strength of the two buildings become very solid. And whatever movement we allow, we allow movement for what we consider for the both, both towers. This proves that when we add the two structures together with the bridge link, they, even, they become even stronger that that's why we were able to reduce, to increase the structural efficiency after the wind tunnel, because the strength is actually multiplied by two with the link beam. And this beam here, if you, if you saw in the video, it's no small beam, it's actually like, the depth here is something like 25 meters, and the girder, uh, sorry, the width here, and, then, and the depth is something like, I think almost 10 meters. Right. Oh, this is just the zoom in floor plan, I'll skip. Right, as you can see, that's the depth of the beam. And this beam is very challenging because it, it is created by steel girders, steel sections. 
assemble off-site and then lift up in pieces, prefabric prefabricated. The uh, I have to say big compliment and um, to the contractor Italian Thai. Italian Thai is our main contractor on this, but Italian Thai couldn't do it themselves too. They they admitted they had to subcontract and work with a French subcontractor. I, sorry, my, my apology, I don't remember the name, but it was the French company who specialized in constructing bridges all around the world. That's the technology that they need. Okay, so basically, this structure was assembled in 10 parts. Each one is about that length. Delivered on site, get lift up, the lifting process it was very interesting. I'm not sure if I have the video here, but um, it moves one foot every one hour. So it's really slow to move from bottom to top. It takes something like a few days in order for them to achieve. Because remember, when you lift it up, the crane has to project out to, to a certain extent in order for the steel girder not to hit the, the, the building also. So that particular process was really difficult for the contractor, but I think they overcame that particular problem because of the uh, uh, specialization of the French company. Okay. Right, I'll skip that. Ah, that's a typical section. I think below the pool, there's nothing. It's just a steel, steel, steel works entirely. Um, one thing that we have increased the safety, even by law in Thailand, it doesn't, um, it, it actually doesn't force you to do. We created the uh, fire sprinkle in, inside this, with this particular steel structure, just in case there is any fire, but in normal circumstances, we don't think there should be any fire here because there is no mechanical, but just in case there is anything, so at least you can put the fire off and across within the steel girders it will be coated with the in, in tumicin coating to protect fire, the fireproof. Um, and also we created a catwalk, a gantry way for servicing in order for the maintenance guy to access once a month to make sure that all the steel works are still maintained intact because we don't, so at least they can go and service and repair if there is anything happen. This is just a drop off. I'll skip too quickly. I think I have some images. I hope ah, that's the image of the uh, the bridge when it was just completed two years ago. Ah, this is the picture of how it was constructed. That's the steel prefab steel piece by piece, electing up to level forty five. So this is. One section is this delivered on site. That's because it's so big and heavy. That's why it takes every one hour can only lift up one foot. And this picture is to represent during the construction that they were trying to do welding, bolting on the steel structure. Um, originally, we wanted to expose the uh, steel structure design. But I think in Thailand and in Asia, people are not used to skeleton kind of design approach. Everyone, every, everyone wants to see something nicely cladded, which is a shame, but you know, we have to go with the market perception. And once we finish the, uh, electing the uh, steel, uh, steel sections, the contractor started casting the swimming pool. And this is the first test for leakage. When, once the concrete uh, were dry, they fill up with water and hoping nothing leaked and of course everything leaked the first time around so <laughs> as usual because you never get it right from the first time so I, but the good thing was when we saw the leaking i think it was something like 12 spots of leakage we were able to identify the problems and fix it i think that was a good thing of the test and of course after the leakage problem had been solved started cladding with aluminum panels, you know. Okay. And then when you zoom in, that's the back. Ah, this is playing at, I think, 1,000 times speed. That's how slow it can be, it, it 
was. The lift up. The French contractor. I think the assembly process was spot on because I think mean, when 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 they connect the last piece, it was less than 50 millimeter tolerance. So I think I think give a big round of applause to Fresenet. And this is our bridge construction equipment that we Italian Thai needed. So this building took almost two and a half years to construct with no basement because we didn't need to go basement. It was nearby the river. Once the rural farm, even if we were nearby the river, tried to avoid basement normally. But um, because of the, uh, the complexity of the bridge, that's why it took longer than normal projects. And the bridge alone, the construction of the bridge alone costed 250 million Thai baht. But you know, I think this project, I think we just know how to spend, where to spend the money. So we spend where, uh, where it needs it. Uh, it needs the, the, to be the wow factor, but we actually don't spend in anything much. Because this <clears throat> and of course, from all that hard work, this is the end result. That's the tower. That's the bridge when it's finished. So you actually get this magnificent view, daytime and nighttime, sunsets along on this particular orientation. You can actually see the river very clear on a clear day. You can see all the way something like 150 kilometers away to on you can see mountains. So I think the residents have actually been enjoying this for two, in the past two years. But I have to admit in the bad very storm storm day like two days ago or yesterday, they have to shut this area because it's probably gonna to be too dangerous from lightning and strong wind. Uh, okay. Oh Another thing that we design is to create safety. So we, we design this protection of, to fall. We have that gap of 1.8 meters so people can never fall. If they fall, they'll just drop into this uh, service area. Okay. Because 1.8 meters is like one grown man. Yeah. And that's the effect during the day. So you actually get this water edge blending in with the city of Bangkok and the Chapraya River. Okay. Ah, and I think fortunately opposite the side it, um, there is a public park. So I think the view, the, the view composition is actually better because your foreground would be all the greeneries and the background would be the river. Right, I think this is very classic. What do architects expect from engineers? So it comes to the second project, which you, you, I think all of you will have a chance to visit this afternoon. Um, this is the um, 2000 seat auditorium in Mahidon University on the outskirts of Bangkok. Um, this is fully acoustic and equipped um, auditorium design. As I said to you, we, when we design, we need to make sure that we understand structure and engineering approach to a degree in order to challenge the engineers back and utilize that approach and knowledge to combine, to integrate as part of the architectural aesthetic. So it's a, I think sometimes it's a shame if you look at this building and you have all these columns hiding in the walls, projecting out. I think, not, not to say it's a bad design because in the old days technology may, maybe wasn't allowed, but as of present, the techno technology allows 
architects to be more creative now. So therefore, I think why not in try to integrate them into the uh, building design, i.e. Pompidou Center was in about 40, 50 years back. It was one of the first buildings to actually express the structure and MNE. So why, why, not, why not try to utilize that? And I think this is another example. This auditorium concept derived from the skeleton, human skeleton, um, human skeleton. So these are, represent the ribs of human. And when we design it, we need to make sure that it reached the proud area, reaching 40 meters up to the top. The construction process was difficult, and because this is such a long span, so if you look at that, it's, a, it, it's actually, in the end, it becomes Y-shaped structure concrete supporting all these trusses. Okay. And everything is, I think when, when, we, when I say long span, it's column three in the, in the middle, and this is the end of the structure. Uh, another example, which I feel a bit of um, disappointment, a little bit, but uh, not entirely. <laughs> I think the structure is so nice and very elegant, but in the end, because of the uh, university, the dean, he likes to see everything nicely finished. That's why we had to finish it off with copper cladding. But imagine if we could actually express all this structure the architecture and the experience and the, the drama of the space inside the hallway would have been different. If you, I think you guys probably know British Museum, for example. If you ever went or seen the photos of British Museum, British Museum in the Great Court, in the Centre Court, if Foster covered it up with some cladding, the drama and the experience would have been totally different. Same thing. I think since we already have since we already designed this kind of very nice, elegant structure, we should be able to express it. But I think it takes time to convince and educate the clients in, in, I think in the Far East. And of course, I think through the process, with all these trusses and steel members happening, we started cladding with copper. And the reason we chose copper is because it's very robust. And I think we, if we want the color to age through time and copper when it ages to, through time it doesn't age any further it will just stay static so that's the kind of look that we want because this this building is to commemorate the uh, late king and I think we want this building to last for another 30 years at least and that's the final product of my hidden um, auditorium Right, that's the Y-shaped structure to support this long span. Uh, I think that's roughly the two projects that I have selected for you and I think I, ho I hope you would enjoy the afternoon session for the Mahidon Auditorium um, facility. Oh, any questions? Sorry. Hi, my name is Nina. Uh, I'm from Kazakhstan and I want to ask you, in which program do you work? Oh, we work on well, Article, Vivid, BIM, BIM, the BIM system, yeah. Yeah. and the 3D Studio, SketchUp, but mainly we work on BIM nowadays, because I think BIM is now the, the most advanced tool for everyone. And it's important for the future program, uh, Revit. Yes, it is. Yes. I think not, not necessarily has to be Revit. Any BIM software, i.e. ArchiCAD, BIM, I think if you guys can get familiarized with. BIM, BIM nowadays is like AutoCAD 25 years ago. We are, we are in, the, in the transition period. Changing like 25 years ago, everyone was changing from paper to computer, and now everyone's changing from all the cat to BIM. So, if, if you guys get, you get yourselves ready now, by the time you graduate, you would be more, you would have more advantage in the market. And I think in, in Europe, in the, in the West, in America, BIM is almost 100% used in all the practices. In Asia, in Thailand especially, I think we are still behind. But in A49, for example, 
seventy percent of our projects are on BIM system at the moment. So, and it's kind of compulsory nowadays. Yeah. And what do you think about Ahikat? I think it's equally good. It's just different for different. Pa it's the same platform really, but just different kind of using. Uh, I don't know what is more user friendly, but to my the feedback from my team is um, Archicad is more user friendly, but we use Revit in A49 because Revit can do more. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. I'm saying this because I'm, I'm not in that generation, so I don't really know how to use it, but we know that's what we need to use because BIM actually calculates everything for you automatically. So in the future, hopefully through on the coordination design coordination process, there will be less errors because everything will be on three-dimensional. So if you have a structure, you have M&E, the architects have BIM software, yeah. you can have everyone will have three-dimensional um, modeling. That means you can check all these pipe routings clashing with your beams, with your windows and everything. So I think that these are the kind of checking, error checking that BIM can, BIM can support you. And either Revit or Archicad, equally good. Okay, thank you. Have you considered the seismic vulnerability in this project, yes, the yes, first one? Yes, I think all, all projects we have to do seismic um, tests. So it's part of the uh, local code also. But we, we, I think the code in Thailand is not as stringent as in Europe and, 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 and Japan, for example. So we, I think, if I remember correctly, we, can only, we only need to design to withstand the five Richter scale as a maximum, I think. Because Thailand is like, uh, the Bangkok is not in a yeah. seismic zone, yeah. that's why. But, uh, I mean, okay, first question is, how many stories were in the podium? The podium part? Seven. Seven. So seven is already a critical situation because there was a one um, mid-rise tower and not a mid-rise, I think. It's almost high-rise because it's 45, right? And another is 55. Yes. So the effect of uh, their movements, like when the earthquake will hit on that, one can rotate in a uh, rotational form and one can go in the translational form. Right. So in that case, how the bridge will affect? The well, as I said to you, the, the building has three components, yeah. two towers and one parking. Um, these two, oh, sorry, these two towers have the bridge link, right? Yeah, like this. Yeah. This two act as one. So in any case, in, in, in any yeah. seismic uh, performance, it will go together. Yes. It will not go like yeah. one is going in rotational, no, 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 one no, is going in no, translational. No. Okay. That's why we stiffen everything by that strong bridge. So this becomes like two big columns with a massive beam linking together. That's how we end up the solution. And the parking is independent. Okay. So the movement of these two towers will never interfere with the that. podium. Yeah. The parking yeah. podium. Okay. Last part is um, what is the reason of choosing the steel structure for the bridge rather than for the concrete? Because concrete is more economical compared to the bridge, as compared to the steel. The cost of the material is more economical, but it's, it's impossible to do form work up in the air. The, but what, uh, why not we did the precast things? Like, there are a lot of bridges, well, if it's already precast. We thought about that, but if, if, it took, if it took us one hour to lift up, 300 millimeter by on steel mm -hmm. it's probably going to take us three hours to lift a piece of concrete up so i think it's it, in the end when you work in a development time is money for developer time because time money. because time time is their interest yeah. rates every month for example this particular project my developer was paying interest at five million baht at a month so therefore if they can save time I suppose, I think it took something like three months to construct the, the bridge. If it were six months, then they would have paid another 15 yeah. million extra. So it will, overall cost will be reduced. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, um, thank you for your uh, interesting um, speeches. And uh, I have a question about the shared, 
shared space. Um, shared space is becoming a hated topic uh, in nowadays, and uh, there are many competitions about the shared, shared space. Um, I want to know what's your opinion and thought about the shared space. Well, what do you mean by shared space? Um, because, um, something like uh, uh, many people use the same space. In, it's kind of a space, uh, public space. Oh, um, okay. Like, and uh, um, um, you mean the living room or the uh, kitchen uh -huh, that people uh -huh. can use together. Oh, okay. I think it it the we call it community space, so, so social space. Yeah, social yeah. space. Um, it is becoming more and more and more important, but it has to be meaningful community space. I think um, you don't, we don't just design big open space and call it community social space, and there is no design attached to it. The design meaning, I'm not saying it has to be with nice finishes, I'm saying design for people to use, because in the end, people will live how the designers design. Just, just, one, one, exa one, just one example. This room, if, if the architect 40 years ago drew, actually drew this room rectangular shape, you guys will have to sit in this rect rectangular room. So I think the, uh, the common space that you refer to is becoming very important because as the city is developing forward in, in all, all major cities, the space are tighter yes. in the residential units itself. For example, 10 years ago, one bedroom size in Bangkok was around 45 to 50 square meter. And nowadays, one bedroom in, on average in the market stands at around 30 square meter. One bedroom meaning one living room and one bedroom. So the, the size of now reduced dramatically. So that means human beings can't really live in the small space. It doesn't matter what race, what nation you're from, which part of the world you're from, human needs space. So the public space is their solution. If they can't stay in the room for long, then they have to come out and socialize and use that open space, the short social space. And I have a good example, like my friend from Hong Kong. I don't know anyone from Hong Kong here. No? Or a city like Hong Kong or Singapore where the density of the population and the uh, urban context is just so high and it's so expensive. I asked my friends from Hong Kong that, wh why am I seeing people, thousands and thousands of people still walking on street at around 11 at night? Because if you look at Bangkok, London and anywhere else, most of the countries in the world, in, in, in the big cities, Around 11 to midnight, everyone would be at home. But they said, the response from all my friends are, because nobody wants to stay at home. Because the moment they come home, they get to live a family of five in the, flat, in the apartment size 60 square meter. So because there is no space for privacy for everything, so that's why everyone preferred to enjoy um, on the largest, on the largest uh, scale of the space which is in public spaces, whether they hang out on street, shopping, eating, uh, or in, in public parks, if it's still, op still open. So I think this is the uh, mentality and psychological approach from any human. So I think this is why it's becoming very important. That's why we created on the first project this main facility for everyone to come out from their room because even though this, the uh, first development that I presented starting from two bedrooms and two bedroom is 75 square meter even though it's quite a sizable unit for a family but still when you have a family of one kid for example kid needs to run kids need to cycle to to cycle kids need to breathe fresh air and the city context doesn't allow that nowadays because the land getting smaller and smaller and so expensive so on, on, on the very high density city, that's why everyone decided to go up, apart from Dubai, where there's still plenty of land, I don't understand why they still need to go up. So that's why I think 
social space will become, well, it actually has become very, very crucial to any development nowadays. Thank you. Okay.